Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Have you had a chance to look at the questions I emailed over? I did. I did. I was trying to answer them as best as possible, and I wrote myself some notes. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. You truly, yes. belong on a, you truly belong on a school board. You take notes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's, if it's okay, we'll begin. To what extent do you think the fringe movement uh, against school boards is dangerous to public education? Please give at least two reasons. Yeah, I think that this fringe movement is dangerous for a number of reasons, but if we're going with two, I think it's the erasure of our marginalized students and their needs. We hear this echoing that all students matter, but when we go through and we review data like our uh, AZM2 data with language arts and math scores, we know that there are significant disparities in our district and statewide between white and Asian students and then our Latinx, indigenous, Pacific Islander, black students who are coming in at the very bottom. And so when we try to have conversations about, okay, but why are these students falling so far behind? That gets disrupted by this movement and then you're called the real racist because you're focusing on marginalized, like historically marginalized students. But it's really about just trying to figure out like why these students are falling so far behind and why they're slipping through the cracks. Um, so it disrupts a lot of those conversations so that we can't help those students. Um, another thing that I'm noticing is the attack on social emotional learning, right? When I was elected into the district um, the year prior, we had a number of teen suicides. I think it was something like ridiculous, like 30 within that year. And as a result of that, we saw a lot of bills being proposed for suicide prevention, um, increases in social workers and counselors, social emotional learning. But we're seeing these groups show up and they don't want us doing suicide assessments because they believe erroneously so that talking about suicide causes suicide. Um, they don't want us doing social emotional learning because they believe that's liberal indoctrination. Mm -hmm. And I am afraid that these groups, as we've seen, like we've seen districts roll back things in our ledge, create laws to support these groups and our students are going to get lost in this and our students really need this help, especially after COVID. Understood. You, you had mentioned that there's more than two reasons. If you'd like to add anything else, please do. <laughs> well, I, I think too, like if, if I could say like, um, and I noticed this in our district and, and, and districts across the state, we had several bond and override elections uh, that took place this year, right? Mm -hmm. And we've seen these groups go around to different school board meetings to try to take these um, elections, right? Because they don't feel like schools need any more money, right? Mm -hmm. But they're giving these messages in terms of like, we support teachers, right? But, you know, if these like policies and, and these measures don't pass, right? That means that districts are faced with the difficult decision of cutting further from public education and unfortunately cutting teachers in the midst of a teacher shortage, right? Which is mm -hmm. you know, referred to as a teacher crisis, right? right? And so these groups are trying to do everything humanly possible to strip money from public education, um, even down to the support of schools losing money for following, following CDC guidelines and recommendations, right? To keep all students safe. Um, and so this is creating a dangerous situation where talking to parents on the other side, they're having to make some difficult decisions and potentially pulling their children and homeschooling in certain cases, which means we lose more students from public education and more public education dollars. To what extent have the other Chandler school board members received the same harassment type treatment as you have? Please explain. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily the same. <laughs> You know that um, unfortunately, like during our, our first board meeting where our members Joel Worth and Jason Olive were sworn in, that was a YouTube meeting where they allowed comments. We didn't have an audience during that meeting. And um, unfortunately, somebody posted Joel Worth's address online, right? Which that's happened to me as well on, on Twitter. Um, but they posted his address, which is, you know, definitely threatening and scary for him and his family. 
Um, Barb Mosden has referenced that prior to this year, she's received like harassment and maybe some lightweight like death threats. Um, she hasn't spoken too in depth about that. Um, but it's kind of the nature of doing this work. I would say that it's more aggressive towards me. Like even when I'm not doing anything or saying anything, um, you know, I have people who are asking me to step down or, or remove myself, or recuse myself from votes on sex ed because my sister sits on Planned Parenthood Advocates Arizona board, which has nothing to do with Chandler and has nothing to do with anything that we do. Um, you know, I have people who attack my family, have created dossiers about me and my family and um, other district students and staff as well. Um, so there's definitely more targeting towards myself. And we also have our um, Director of Equity, and, um, Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Adama Salu. And she's received a number of targeted harassment and, and threats to her. And it, it seems to be targeted and levied heavier at Black women. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, anything, anything else you'd like to add to number two before we go on to number three, please? Yeah, I think that a lot of this is intentional to just kind of drown out my voice, which if you think about it, I am the only person of color, only black woman on our school board, right? Mm -hmm. And our district is not predominantly white anymore. Our district is predominantly like Hispanic, um, black, right now, um, mostly um, Hispanic Latin, right? And so if this is happening to me on a public level where talking about like the needs of our most marginalized students is a problem and I'm being silenced and targeted, imagine like, you know, what it is like to be a student of color in our district as well. Right, no, I, I, totally, I totally get that. Number three, what is your response to these families who unprofessionally protest equity programs or critical race theory, if, if that actually exists, or COVID-19 mitigation me measures, please explain. I don't know that it's important for me to respond to these families anymore. I think that the community has to start responding to these groups, right? Because these groups are coming in and saying that they're speaking on behalf of all families. And, and that's not the case. Like I get my inbox flooded, with families who are like, no, we don't support this. Like we need to do something. But I am from a marginalized group and in the minority on my board, right? And so my one voice isn't gonna make as much of an impact as the community coming in and challenging some of the things that are going on in our meeting, right? Like we have these groups who are getting up and they are saying, pretty bigoted statements about LGBTQ groups, about our Jewish families and Jewish communities, um, you know, about a bunch of different groups that, you know, we see with kind of like these very bigoted micro and macro aggressions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but nobody's there to challenge them and the board is not in the position necessarily to challenge public comments because of how those laws work we need community members to show up and, and strongly challenge these things and say, hey, you don't represent us. We're okay with equity and inclusion. We know that this district is not teaching critical race theory. And if they were, so what? It's not a threatening theory, right? Um, we need those groups to kind of step up and challenge that. More people need to show up. And I think that action needs to take place outside of emailing the board. Okay, very good. <laughs> Number four, what is your opinion of the Maricopa County Democratic drive under Alexia Galloway to recruit diverse candidates to run for school boards in the next election cycles? Please explain. I own Alexia, and I think that Alexia is a wonderful leader, and I respect her as a Black woman in leadership and everything that she's trying to accomplish with MCDP. I don't know a lot about the school board recruitment training. I've heard a little bit about it, and I can't wait to hear more. Um, I think that that is important to recruit people from marginalized or underserved communities to run for these offices and, and train them because, hey, like we need to give community members who don't have access the ability to run for office and the resources. So I think that is a wonderful endeavor. Um, I think on the other side, and I think that you know, Alexi and I have had co conversations about this as well as, you know, it's not just about 
recruiting and running, right? But what do we do to support these members in their roles once they get elected too? And so I think that she very much understands that. Um, and I can't wait to see what this program offers. Um, I would say that I am a little bit more concerned about the Arizona Coalition of School Board Members, which is kind of like the Republican counter, although they are, are claiming that they're nonpartisan, but they have a full Republican board. They are spinning some of these anti-equity and anti-CRT messages. Like one of our former board members in Chandler was asked to speak, but was kind of thrown out of their program um, just because he was initially on the board when they signed our equity and inclusion initiative, right? Um, and so that is where my concern is in terms of like, are we making this about partisan politics, which we know that schools are political. Um, we fully admit that now, but this seems to be a bit more of a dangerous endeavor where we have this group who is catering to a lot of these fringe ideas. And it's not about our students, it's about the 2022 and 2024 election. Number five, do you feel, despite the rants of the fringe right, that you are making a positive difference for children, teachers, and parents as a member of the Chandler Unified School Board? Please explain. Um, I had to go back in, and forth about this because people have asked me this question before. And I, I've come to the realization after talking to you, community members, well, I don't feel that me sitting on the board has an impact. It does have an impact for other people, me just showing up and, and speaking to their concerns, right? Um, or even voting so that Chandler High School has an African-American studies and a Chicano studies history class, right? That was something that I was really proud of and talked with the teachers who were spearheading that. And I was really excited and families are really excited to have those history classes incorporated, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or even showing up to um, council member O.D. Harris in Chandler. He hosted a teen suicide um, event and invited some of our black student unions and invited me to speak and several other dignitaries. Um, those are the moments that I think, you know, make the most impact and just kind of like seeing me up on the dais or seeing me coming out and representing as a part of the board. Um, however, you know, it has been discouraging being the only voice that constantly gets outvoted when I talk about the concerns of our marginalized communities and having board members say, well, we haven't heard that, so it must not be true. Um, but I would challenge and say, like, maybe you haven't heard that because maybe you haven't broadened your circle beyond who shows up to our meetings, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's been the frustrating part is meeting those same barriers that our, our families and students continue to meet where nobody takes us seriously or we're gaslit um, and nobody's really hearing us. As a brief follow-up, if I may, uh, do you feel you're the only per only person on the island on the board? Um, I will say that it's constantly me and um, Laura Bruner, who is a teacher, I believe, in Tempe Union. Um, and she's the only educator on our board. Okay. And I think that, you know, she gets kind of put out there too, right? Like, it's usually if there's a no vote, it's usually me and her. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, and so, but it is kind of isolating being on a school board, right? Because you can't have the relationships that you would have with like other colleagues, right? Okay. Um, just because you want to avoid like any accusations of, you know, open meeting or, right. or any of that yeah. violations. But um, it is a pretty isolating experience being the only Black woman on the board, right? Because when it comes to a vote around equity or a discussion around equity, um, such as when we voted on the bylaw change for Arizona School Board Association to include an indigenous school board member and a Hispanic school board member on the ASBA board. I was up against four other board members who wanted to pull it because 
one person felt like it was racist to create more room at the table for historically marginalized groups and felt like we didn't need to do that because Kamala Harris was the vice president and couldn't oh. see why that statement was wrong, right? right. Um, and so right. it's constantly going up against those voices and being the only one in the room who it's like, wow, like we're really doing this but then having like this audience who's also anti-equity echoing and being like the chorus to this as well. Um, and that's been pretty disheartening to see. And I think like disturbing for a lot of our community members to see how our local government works around these things. Number six, is there anything not covered in the first five questions that you would like the readers to know? Please explain. I think, you know, if I can just emphasize, like we really need people to show up um, if you don't like some of the bigoted narratives that go on in our school board meetings, or you feel like this is taking away from students, you know, there's a good saying called closed mouths don't get fed, right? Right. And so when we don't hear or boards don't hear from community members who are like, no, we don't support these anti-equity, anti-CRT parents or these parents who want to remove some book from like the the library because it's offensive and it talks about gender and identity right if those are things that you are appalled by sitting at home it's incumbent upon you to show up and voice that and show up in strong numbers these groups are very organized mm -hmm. and when people don't show up they make an impact they go to the right. ledge they laws passed, right? Um, and, and, and we're going to see that in the next legislative session, right? Um, but we need people to show up and get active. Uh, just because Joe Biden was elected the president doesn't mean that there's not more work and more fight. No, I, I, I understand. I'm going to stop the recording right now. Okay. And